So <coughs> thank you very much for inviting me to give you an introduction to the Personal Genome Project UK. I, I believe uh, that if, if we do get it right, we really have a unique opportunity here to, to, to advance genomics in a way that it will be translational for, for healthcare, and in fact not only healthcare, also to understand human biology and, and human genetics in a much better way. And let me just give you a very brief history to set up the space in which these projects operate, and, and this is really with focus on the UK only. So clearly the Human Genome Project was a catalyst for this, and that's not the human, uh, that's not a UK project, that was an international project, as are many of the others, but I, I, I will focus mostly on, on UK-centric project for, for this talk. Uh, after that, uh, very few people know that actually the first large-scale genome sequencing project was the Personal Genome Project that was launched in 2005 by George Church at Harvard University and that was followed by projects that you may, not, may know more about was, was much later. For instance, the Thousand Genomes Project came three years later the, and then in the UK that was followed by the UK 10,000 Genomes Project uh, and then in 2013 the, uh, the 100,000 Genomes Project, the NHS driven Genomes Project, sequencing 100,000 patients, was launched uh, and is uh, being conducted by Genomics England. And in the same month, in, in July 2013, uh, we, we got ready to start the PGP UK. So these are the projects, a little bit in the context, that I want to talk about. And while we all have the same aim in, in mind, there are of course different ways how to go about it, and, and that's very justified. Uh, because there, there, there is a different context in which each of these projects operates. But one distinguishing feature that I want to labor on a little bit because I thought this is uh, what this meeting is interested in would be how the data is being accessed, the access uh, to, to the underlying data. And of course you might remember the, the Human Genome Project pioneered really open access. It was one of, of the great achievements of this project to make sure that the data are freely and immediately available to everyone on the internet. It wasn't a big, such a big problem then because no phenotypic data were attached to it. It was simply a consensus sequence of uh, a whole bunch of different individuals that got uh, mixed up and, and sequenced and, and therefore it was at the time was not such a big issue. But as you can see from there on only the personal genome projects have truly open access and I will explain a little bit what I mean with that, whereas all the other follow-up projects have something that is called managed access and, and it's an important distinction. And even so, I will be advocating open access. I also want to make clear that there is, of course, a perfect justification, and I'm part of managed access projects as well, in the context of which you do this project, that they should be managed. What, what I'm trying to say is we need to have a balance to apply the smallest common denominator across all projects is, is scientifically not justifiable and is, is actually confounding and is, is, is not a good thing in my view. And I try to convince you why that is the case. So a few words on the human, uh, on the, sorry, the uh, PGP UK. Uh, it was launched last November. Uh, it is open to all UK citizens and permanent residents over 21 years in the US. It's also 21 years, but that's because it's legal age. In the UK, the legal age is 18, so we had a debate about should we go to 18, but we thought at that point it would be good to add the extra years to give the individuals the maturity uh, to make the decision whether they want to participate or not. So we, we thought the maturity is more important than legal age in this particular circumstance, and but we will uh, keep a, an open mind and can revisit that if, if there's a case to be made. Uh, it uses open consent and open access policies. And because there is a lot of confusion about this, I will go into this in a little bit more detail. And it is classified as a research project. So we are not a clinical project, so we are completely independent of the 100,000 uh, NHS patients to be sequenced, Genomics England. There is, is, there is no overlap with this project. On the other hand, this project, the PGP UK, makes all the data available, so Genomics England has all our data available if they wish for their own evaluation, but it's not the other way around for, for obvious reasons. 
and uh, as as of uh, we uh, as of today or uh, for a long time actually now we have over thousand uh, sorry ten thousand volunteers registered and the first. 1,000 fully enrolled, which means they've signed the consent form, they've passed the entrance exam, and I will say a little bit more about this. And we could have many more, but we paused the project at this point to give us an opportunity to catch up, because otherwise we, we, we would have to manage expectations that more people want to participate than we can possibly deal with. Okay. So <laughs> let me make uh, then clear what I mean with the consent and access options. So most projects, and this includes the, the 1,000 genomes project, the 10,000 and 100,000 genomes project that I mentioned before, uh, use a, a, a version of consent which is known as informed consent. What, what this does is it, it, promise, it promises anonymity to, to the participant. And, and, and that's something which we believe these days is very difficult to keep even with the best intention, as this article really laid out in, in great detail, it is today almost impossible to, to make that promise. And therefore, I think the time might have come to revisit how, what language should be actually used in many of the consent forms, because it is inherently impossible to guarantee anonymity. So what informed consent allows you to do then is, in these cases, it allows you to link genomic data with health, health record data. And this is what we're all interested in. The, we, the, the genomic data alone is always available, freely available, but it is scientifically less informative, in fact, almost use, useless, if you don't have the underlying uh, phenotypic information available, certainly for the, uh, the areas that, that most people would be interested in. So the result then of having informed consent is that you can link genetic data and health data, but the access cannot be open access, but it has to be managed. As a result, you either you as a participant or the population will get no or only very limited feedback from what is found. And, and that is in the process of changing. There are now recommendations that clinically significant findings should be reported back, but there is no regulation that, that, that they have to be reported back. But I'd like to point out a, a, a good attempt towards this in the UK 10,000 Genomes Project that was led by, K, uh, by, by Jane Kay, uh, where they have developed the framework now for the 10,000 Genomes Project, how to report back incidental findings, even so the volunteers uh, signed a consent form that told them, you will not hear from us, we will not tell you about any of the genetic findings or variants that we find. And, and I, I think there is, is a change of minds there. And the first uh, framework has been implicated. So that also, of course, means that there is either no or very restricted access to the public, which is just indicated by these three gray figures in the background there. And, and it means these data are lost to research, which, which really is a, great, uh, is, is a great pity. So what, what do we different in PGP UK? Well, we, we have a different type of consent. We call it open consent, which allows us to link genomic data and health record data uh, and make both of them linked, available under open access, freely unrestricted to everyone. So, therefore, what we cannot do and we do not want to do is to promise anonymity. We simply inform the participants that there is a good chance that they can be identified. Many, chose, many choose to self-identify. A good proportion actually is willing to self-identify. But those who are not self-identifying, we, we certainly anonymize them, but we inform them at great length about all the risks that they can be identified. So that means all data will be returned to the participant and all data will be freely and unrestrictedly available for public, to the public for, for research. Something that we plan to bridge the gap between informed consent and open consent is what we call a consent converter. So that's as part of PGP, we have an effort where we want to generate the framework in a similar way as the framework has been generated now for the incidental findings that we have 
a, a situation where people whose genome has been sequenced under an informed cons consent that would restrict the release of the data in a way that they could participate by converting their consent into an open consent and therefore everything that is uh, of people that agree, their data could be made available. So the consent converter would, if he could generate the framework, and as I say, this is a plan, this has not been done yet, but we are working on this, is to con convert informed into open consent. And it facilitates genome donations for those who have had their genome sequenced, either as part of the NHS or other projects. They could then participate and have the benefits of projects such as PGP UK. So openness matters, and I, I'm afraid I do labor that point because I want to make absolutely clear that everyone understands why we are so passionate about this. Uh, and I want to show the example of dbGaP. I also uh, contacted uh, the EGA, which is the European equivalent of dbGaP, where all genotypic and phenotypic data will be deposited. But EGA uh, declined to provide the information, whereas uh, DBGAP, the American US equivalent, gave uh, released the full access data to, to both the managed and open access uh, accesses in, in the database since their conception in 2007. So these databases are not that old. So what turns out is that the managed access there is worldwide for all projects, which is a huge number of projects, is about 150 people request access to, to one of these projects compared to this 75 million to open access downloads. So you can see that the difference is 500,000 fold, which is an enormous difference and it will not be difficult to argue, of course, that open access, the more people can see it, uh, the more will the, the research be accelerated and, and that's extremely well supported by uh, scientific publications as well. Of course, ironically, what is happening, uh, and I, I'm not critical about the managed uh, access because I'm part of several projects that do it, is that the majority of funding, because these are clinically driven projects, is, is in, in this area where there is only managed access. But I think the balance is wrong currently and PGP UK tries to, to redress the balance here. What PGP also does is it, it enables citizen science. What we mean with that is in the middle here, the patient, or not the patient, the participant is in the middle and we consider the participant as an active, not a passive collaborator. What you see here is a number of projects which have all sprung up as, uh, as that have come out of PGP UK where individuals who had disclosed their phenotypic and health information on, on the database uh, were contacted uh, by other groups and these 17s are projects that have recruited PGP participants based on the information that was available to them. And, and that's totally outside PGP. They can uh, decline to take part or they can take part. From what we know from the feedback is that the participants love to be involved. So they are really fascinated of being part of, of an, a large number of research projects. So just to put some faces to it, the first 10 people that were sequenced all, uh, all decided to self-identify and George Church here in the middle is PGP1 and the other individuals were all sequenced in the first round of the PGP project. And of course the sequencing costs are coming down so uh, eventually there, there, there is the cost is low enough that sequencing can be done for all if you want to do this and PGP is positioning itself to really be in the space that a lot of genome sequences will become open access available for research. Uh, so after the US in 2005, uh, Canada launched in 2012 UK, we launched 2013, and as we speak, 10 more countries are currently in the process of setting up their project and are launching. So by the end of this year or next year, we might well have 10 or more projects and a million uh, genomes uh, sort of underwritten to be released once they become available under open access. If I have two or three more minutes, then I go through a couple of stats just to tell you a little bit about the lessons because PGP is now coming up to its 10th year next year and so there is enough time to see what, what has worked well and what is not working well and so I, I would 
uh, refer you to the paper that the PGP, the US version of the PGP, we haven't got enough data to, 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 to make these charts, but the US has been running SSA for nine years and they have data, and these are the data, and this is the publication they made available. Two stats that I want you to take uh, home. Uh, the message is, so the, these are interactions, participant, initiated communication and what, what we are very excited about here is that the withdrawal rate is at 3.8 percent. It's extremely low. Even so, it seems to be a high-risk project to be involved, involved. The retention rate is, is incredibly high, much higher than many of the other projects. And a, a second statistic is uh, we were always, one, we were always uh, asked how do you get uh, any participant. Well, the, the stats speak for themselves. We have plenty of volunteers, people are interested, and even the high stringent criteria that they have to fulfill, you can see here that the, the, the take home message is lots of people are interested and start making an account and say we are interested, uh, and the statistic says about 50% succeed in actually reading all the literature, passing the test, doing a lot of things that we require them to do. 50% is enormous when you consider they have 50, 60 pages of documentation to read. A test to pass, 47 questions. If you miss a single question, you, you are out. So you have to study. And if you don't study the material, you actually will not pass the test. It's a tough test. I would invite everyone to take the test just for fun. You don't have to even register. Just download the question and see if you can answer them. So the summary is that open consent uh, the big difference to informed consent is there is no promise of privacy or confidentiality uh, and this is simply reflecting reality in today's world that if you promise it you, you might not be able to keep it and, and, and that might be even more dangerous. Uh, it is the first in the UK and Europe that uh, we got ethical approval for the project. Uh, it runs completely under open access so it has a, a, a Creative Commons zero license which means it is non-profit non and it makes integrated genome, environmental and medical personal data available to everyone. So the participants that we have are highly informed, as I explained, they really have to pass a lot of tests, the study guide, entrance exam, and regular feedback three times a year. You have to fill in a questionnaire. If you don't fill it out, you're out. So this shows a lot of commitment. Um, we, you receive all the information, of course, including clinically significant information. Um, we consider people as active, not passive collaborators. And uh, the PGP, at least the PGP 10, yes, and it's just my last slide, uh, are, are now uh, arguably, you might say, the most analyzed humans in, in, in the world. So with that, I'd like to close. Thank the, uh, all the volunteers of the team. There are all volunteers that are listed here that contribute to the team. And of course, special thanks to, to George Church and, and Jason Bowe, who have really helped us and were instrumental, instrumental in helping us to set up the project. Mm -hmm.